girl's good. Like, that hurt my vocal cords. I was standing back there. I did a couple somersaults when she hit that. How did she hit that note? I'm just still trying to figure that out. Welcome to New Spring today. And uh, we're in the middle of this Lord of the Rings series. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, um, my blog has, like, received a record number of emails throughout this series. And, uh, and so that's been, that's been great. Um, but if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn with me. We're going to be looking at two sections of Scripture this morning. Uh, Ephesians 5 and Genesis chapter 3. And ladies, since next week is like Woman Sunday, uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 next week too. And so we just figured we'd study this passage just for, for a couple weeks. I was dating Lucretia, and uh, she was in Augusta in medical school. I was in Anderson, and we drove. I drove back and forth to see her. And one particular weekend, I was in Augusta, and w- I was getting ready to come home, and, and we decided to go eat at Chick-fil-A. You know you have arrived in a relationship when you can go to Chick-fil-A and she still enjoys the meal. You know, it wasn't all about where we went, so we went to Chick-fil-A, and I saw that day in Chick-fil-A one of the one of the top pet peeves in my life. Like, you know there's certain things that make you mad, and then there are certain things that make you want to punch somebody in the throat. I'm just being honest. Never heard a pastor say that. Welcome to New Spring. And I, I really became angry that day because I'm standing in Chick-fil-A. We got our food. We were sitting out at our table. And I, I'm sitting there watching. And this family comes in. It's a mother and several kids. And they all came following. They're like little ducks or whatever, like little ducklings. And they walk up to the, the counter. And the mother, see, women want everything to be in order. Women want everything to be nice. Women want everything to be neat. And so the mother is trying to order for the children. Now, if you've got children and you're a mom, you know how stressful this is. What do you want? Okay, he doesn't want the pickle and he doesn't want the fries and don't give him the bear. It scared him last time. And you're trying to order. And and so you're ordering. And and the dad, I watched the dad. The dad came in the door, went and leaned up against the trash can, folded his arms and just stood there. He's just kind of like there. You know, most dads, like like a lot of you men are going, yeah, what's, what's the deal? And so the mother is trying to order. She's got like three kids. She's trying to order. All of a sudden, the kid looked to be about three years old, had a complete meltdown. Now, those of you that are parents know that your children never melt down at really good times. They're always going to melt down and freak out when you least want it to happen. I had a friend that said his four-year-old melted down on a plane one time because she wanted a pumpkin. For some reason, she just wanted a pumpkin. I want a pumpkin! And you can't get one of those on most planes. You, You know what I'm saying? So the four-year-old, three- or four-year-old completely melts down, freaks out, and starts screaming at the top of his lungs. Now, mom, mom's still trying to keep order. She's trying to order, oh, okay, well, okay, woo, no chicken for you, and trying to figure out what's going on. And she's, she looks at the husband like, you know what I'm talking about, women? She looks at the husband like, do something. Beat your child, whatever it takes. Help me out here. The dad does this. The kid continues the meltdown by grabbing a high chair, one of the you can push around, and starts doing laps around Chick-fil-A, screaming at the top of his lungs. Mom still trying to order for the family. Dad stands there and does absolutely nothing nothing and I wanted to punch this guy in the throat I'm being dead serious don't look at me don't and don't send me an email I can't believe you said that I said it get over it because passive men tick me off and they tick God off too and if you're a man and you're married to a woman and you're passive it's ticking her off now you didn't have to say amen there ladies but that elbow see that's illegal don't do that during the uh, don't do that are the I told you so eyes? Don't, don't do those. Wait till you get out, okay? Today I want to talk to you about being a passive man. Because the Bible, see, see the world says that a man should be certain things. And the media has upheld, this is what you got to be to be a man. And, and, and you know, live for the weekend. You've heard guys say, well, you can tell who a man is by the number of women that he's had sex with. And that's not true because a dog can have sex with a lot of different people. 
doesn't make you a man. It just makes you equivalent to an animal. What is a man? What is a man? Where should we look, men, for the definition of manhood? Where is the man that we should look at and say, I want to be like him. I want to follow him. I want to emulate him. I'm telling you, according to Scripture, there is one role, there is one role model for you and I, men, to look up to. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you and I as men will seek to become more like him, I believe our homes will be better. I believe our families will be better. I believe our jobs will be better. I believe our careers will be better. I believe our life will be better. And I know our eternity will be better if we just plug into Jesus. Today, I want to talk to you about biblical manhood. And men, listen to me before I even get started. I'm not speaking today as an expert. I'm speaking as somebody that struggles with you. The things I'm going to be sharing with you today are not things that I have down. These are not things that I have mastered. And please do not walk away from this message going, Perry wants us to be more like him because that will screw you up. I want you to be more like Jesus. That's what I'm, I'm trying. My, my wife doesn't need for me to be more like Ashton Kutcher. I'm sorry I just stepped on some of your idols. She needs for me to be more like Jesus because a man like Jesus can love her like she needs to be loved. Let me tell you, some of you single guys, something. I want you to listen to me. Women, single women, do not sit around and dream about the passive male. I want my husband to be so passive. You know what single women dream about? They even dream about the knight riding in on the horse. Kicking the dragon's tail, you know, get out of here, dragon. Knocking the door down, throwing her over her shoulder and carrying her off and, and treating her like a queen or a princess for the rest of her life. That's what single women are looking for. And single women, it's hard. 60% of the Christians today in America are women. 40% are men. And I believe, you, you know who I blame for that? I blame the church. Because of the picture we painted of Jesus. And so today, we're just going to go to Scripture. We're going to look in Ephesians 5, Genesis 3. I'm going to show you what I believe a man should be according to Scripture. Number one, a man should be the priest of his home. Single ladies, this today is, is what you should look for in a man. These three things I'm going to give. A man should be the priest of his home. Now, let me, let me say something. And let me just, ladies, women, let me tell you something that probably most men would never tell you. Your husband has probably never told you this. And when you leave today, you're, you're going to be tempted to ask your husband, is that, is that true what he said? And your husband, if he says no, he lied. This is true. What I'm about to tell you is true. There's a lot of pressure in being a man. And ladies, it's pressure that you will never understand. And I know a lot of you women go, what about a preacher being a woman? We're talking about that next week, okay? Just calm down. We got, you're special, and we understand that. But there's pressure in being a man. It's scary being a man. It really is scary being a man. And you know what a man's number one temptation is when trouble and trials come to his home? It's what we sang about right before I came out. Men are tempted to walk away. Men are tempted to walk away. It's scary when you know that all eyes are on you, and you're for, you have to make the decision. And instead of embracing that, like most men should, men simply walk away from that. I remember, I remember it, let, let's, let's take it to the church for a second. Leading this church has always been somewhat of a unique challenge. And I remember when we used to meet in the Fine Arts Center, it was 2001. We had just moved into the Fine Arts Center at Anderson College. And I'm getting ready at home because I lived on campus, so I was getting ready. And all of a sudden, when I'm getting ready, I heard... Boom! And I was like, oh, somebody's dead. That's cool. And so anyway, I, I, I walk outside my door, and Lee Bell, who's now our director of security, says, hey, man, all the power's out in the Fine Arts Center. And what do you mean all the power's out? He said, the power's out. We walked over, look, the power was out in the Fine Arts Center. We came to discover that the squirrel had decided he no longer wanted to live and jumped into a transformer. And uh, everybody's like, what does the squirrel look like? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I mean, it's just kind of laying there. We found the squirrel. It was really sad. I know animal lovers are going, oh, it's a squirrel. Get over it. So we were trying to figure out what we were going to do because we had 350 people coming to church that morning. 
We're like, where do we put these people? And, and everybody was like, what about this? And what about this? And we're all standing around in a big group of people. And Jason Wilson, the guy that came out and made the announcements, looked at me and said, I said, well, what are we waiting on? And Jason said, we're waiting on you to make a decision. And I wanted to run and hide. I didn't want to make the decision. I was scared to death. And everybody just stood there like, what do we do? What do we do? I said, put chairs outside. And we did. We had chairs outside that morning, had church on the lawn. It was great. But the deal is, making that decision scared me to death. And being a man is scary. You, 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 know what, you know how I know that men are tempted to walk away? Because there's a lot of men following those temptations. That's why here in America, we've got way more single mothers than we do single fathers. We've got way more children that know who their mother is opposed to who their daddy is. Because men, when they're forced to make a decision and step up and own up to being a man, instead of breaking away from the tradition of the world that tells you to run away, instead of breaking away, men walk away and they neglect the biblical calling on their lives to step up and be a man and lead their family and be the priest of their home. You say, where do you get this idea of a priest? Ephesians 5, chapter, um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible says this. Husbands, love your wives. Now, if he stopped right there, it'd be easy. Because men would be like, I can do that. Honey, I love you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. You know, that'd be easy. But the Bible says this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Do you see that? Men, we are supposed to love our wives and embrace the role in our family just like Christ, that's like Jesus, loved the church. That's our role. That's our calling. There's not one man in this room that can step up and go, uh, God didn't call me to do that. Listen, bro, if you are a man, that is God's calling on your life and my life to love our wife just as Christ loved the church. Christ was the priest. Christ is the priest of his church. The priest in the Old Testament gave himself up to serve the people. Jesus Christ gave himself up to serve us. And we as husbands and as men are to give ourselves up to serve and love and care for and nurture our family. You know what women are looking for, men? You know what women, you know what one of the number one desires of a woman's heart is? Commitment. She wants to know that you're committed. You look at Jesus in the church. Has Jesus, have we given Jesus reasons to leave us alone in the past 2,000 years? I mean, the church, let's just face it, the church doesn't have a really good track record. Look at the stuff we've done. The Inquisition thing, wasn't good. The Crusades, wonderful example of Christians missing the point. Televangelists with bad hairstyles. I mean, if I'm Jesus, I check out right then, don't you? But Jesus, no matter how bad the church has gotten, has said, I'm dedicated to you, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to provide for you. And men, you know what your wives want? Single guys, you know what she's going to look for one day? She's going to look for the man that can look her in the eye and say, no matter how bad this family gets, no matter how terrible our relationship may seem at times I don't care if I lose my job I don't care if we get a bad report from the doctor I don't care if one of our kids goes crazy I don't care what happens I am dedicated to you and I am dedicated to this family and I will never leave no matter what that's what she wants I know some single guys going I don't think I could make that commitment then bro you don't need to get married because you and I are called to be the priest of our home. And the priest does not walk away from his priestly duties. The priest embraces his priestly duties. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. You don't know my wife. You don't know my God. My God is bigger than your wife. I don't know. My wife is... You and I are called to be priests. Amen. And that's easy, right? 
And now, now a lot of you are thinking, priest. Okay, what do I got to do to be a priest? Honey, we got to leave. I got to get a robe. Um, I got to get a ring. And you and the kids are going to have to kiss the ring when you come into the house. I mean, that's not, I'm not, that's, that's not where we're going here. Man, in order to be the priest of your home, you and I simply need to become more like Jesus. Now, let me just say this, and this is, oh, this is, this is going to tick some people off. And that's why I'm saying it. Let me tell you why a lot of men don't want to become like Jesus. It's because the church has distorted who Jesus is. Come on now, you, you remember flannel graph Jesus in Sunday school? You remember the guy? He had on a white robe with a gold sash, holding a lamb, always cried, you know, sipped decaf and listened to Elton John. You know what I'm talking about, that Jesus? I'm going to be honest with you. I can't follow that Jesus because I could beat him up. As a man, I can't follow somebody I can beat up. And that's the Jesus that we, Jesus always wants to cry and hold you and, and you know, oh, you got lint in your belly button and kind of talk about stuff like that. Let me tell you something. That's not Jesus. You want to see who Jesus is? We need to go to the book of Revelation. And I know Revelation, it freaks some of you out. Oh, Revelation! And you're just too worried about getting <clears throat> left behind. And I want to go to Revelation. Some of you got that. And, and, and kind of tell you who Jesus is. Because some of you go, oh, Revelation, it freaks you out because you think, oh, the Revelation, and I'm going to have to get a barcode on my head so I can go to Target and they can scan me to get deodorant. That's not what Revelation is. Wouldn't that be weird, huh? Beep, beep, beep. And you're like, you had to go to the chiropractor afterwards because your neck hurts. That's not what Revelation is about. I, men, men, Jesus Christ was a humble servant. Jesus Christ was a humble servant. He came to serve us. But that's not the, if that's the only picture you have of Jesus, you will never truly surrender your life to him. Because men admire warriors. When the movie Braveheart came out, like every man... I don't want to be William Wallace. And, and you know what I'm saying? You went and bought swords and stuff like that. Don't lie. Some of y'all have a sword. This is Jesus. And I love this picture of Jesus in Revelation 19. Look at this. Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw, and this is John talking about Jesus. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Oh, Jesus is peaceful. Uh, no, see, at the end, in the book of Revelation, he's coming back and he's kicking everybody's tail. Like, it's, like it, you know, what about his enemies? Hey, we're going to oppose Jesus. <laughs> and it's over. That's it. He's coming to make war. You know why? Jesus is a warrior and he fights for what is his. Men, if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to be warriors and we've got to fight for what belongs to us. Well, let's keep reading because this is great. His eyes are like blazing fire. This does not sound like decaf Elton John Jesus, does it? I know some of you like Elton John. And we're going to have a time of repentance at the end. You can do that. It would be great. And on his head are written many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Let me stop right here. That's a bad dude. When you take your robe and you dip it in blood, you're not playing games. This is a guy that will come and mess you up. This is Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, bloody robe. This is who Jesus is. Don't look at me like that. Some of you, I've never heard this. His name, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Let me stop. Everybody's wearing white. I've heard this said before. I'll say it again. If you're going to fight a dude and he shows up wearing all white, He's really confident in where this fight is heading. Like, he's not scared. The only blood he's going to get on him is your blood. Are we tracking? He goes on to say, um, verse 15, Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rue them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has written... He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which there may be biblical evidence out of there for a tattoo. I have no idea, but the name's written on the thigh. Now, I know some of you be scared tattoo. Don't send me an email then, okay, because I'm not going to answer it. This is Jesus. This is not weak, pathetic Jesus. This is 
man Jesus, the warrior and the fighter. And men, I'm calling us today to become warriors and fighters. Not just in corporate America, not working our rear ends off for the promotion, not working our rear ends off for the race. We need to be warriors and fighters when it comes to the heart of our wives and our children. If we're ever going to become like Jesus, we've got to become a warrior. I'm not, man, this is, this is hard for some people, but let me tell you something, men. If you don't lead your family, Satan will. If you don't lead your family, Satan will. You know, believe me, Genesis chapter 3. Let me read you this story. We're going to come back to this a couple times. The Bible says this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, come on, Eve. It's gone through so many different translations. Did God really say that? Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, which is a problem. Women should not talk to like serpents. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it. We're coming back to that. Or you will surely die. Verse 4, you will not surely die, which is a lie, by the way. Anybody seen Eve today? Anybody seen Eve? There's a reason. She's dead. Just want to point that out. God's right. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, we're coming back to this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her weak, pathetic, passive husband who was with her, stood there and watched the whole thing. He just watched the whole thing. And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together to make coverings for themselves. Men, if you don't lead your family, if you don't embrace the role of the priest and say, you know what, I'm going to humbly serve my family, I'm going to serve my wife, I'm going to serve my children as a leader, but I'm also going to be the warrior, and I'm going to be more passionate about my family than I am about my job. If we don't embrace that role, the family in America will continue to disintegrate at an alarming level rate the priest the second role that we need to embrace is called the prophet <laughs> the prophet a lot of y'all like i need i need to be a prophet yeah that's what i need you say peter what's a what's a prophet well a prophet is somebody that speaks the truth a prophet is somebody that knows the truth and speaks the truth boldly because here's the deal, the majority, I, I see so many homes that, and, and listen, I was in youth ministry for a really long time, kids would come out of their homes believing false doctrine and false theology, and it was taught to them by their father. And if we allow false things to come into our house, men, and our kids and our wives wind up believing false things, ultimately, I'm going to show you this at the end of the, in, in the message, it's our fault, because we're supposed to be the prophet. See, because when you believe something that's not true, you can wind up getting hurt. Did you know that? When you believe something that's not true, it can wind up hurting you. I remember one time, I loved prime rib. I used to love prime rib. Let me tell you about it. I used to love prime rib. I discovered how many fat grams this is on prime rib, and I won't eat it anymore. If I know the fat grams, like if I don't know it, I'll eat it all day. But I found, and it just really bothered me, so I can't eat prime rib anymore. Sorry. And so I, I, but this one time I was eating prime rib, and they had a little side of horseradish with it. Now, I had never had horseradish. Didn't know what horseradish was. I thought it was potatoes. I thought they have brought me a side of potatoes, and this is really kind of them. So I take my fork, I dipped it, got a big scoop of horseradish, and I stuck it in my mouth and began to chew. Now, I did use profanity, but I was not a Christian, so it was really okay I let them fly. I was like, what the? And everyone's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I ate the potatoes. I'm like, dude, that's not potatoes. That's horseradish. I, I stuck a, like, gob of horseradish in my mouth, and it hurt. Now, I'd have never done that if I'd have known it was horseradish. If somebody was saying, you know, that's horseradish, and that'll burn you, I would have said, mmm, and, like, stuck it in my mouth. I would have been like, thank you very much. But because I didn't know something was true, I put it in my mouth, and it burned me. 
And men, the same thing is true in our homes. It's up to you and I to be the prophets of our home. We get this from Ephesians 5, 26, where Scripture says this. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Men, we need to be men of the, men of the word. We need to read our Bibles. Scripture right here calls us to know the word of God. Now, now, if you're a man, listen, dude, don't even try to talk to me after the service or send me an email this week going, I just can't read the Bible. Yes, you can. You can pick up your Bible and read it. I can't memorize the Bible. You know who won the Super Bowl 20 years ago? A few weeks ago, I was on the stage. I was like, the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl in 1984. I had a dude the very next, like, three days later meet me in the lobby and say, you know it was 1985, don't you? I was like, yeah, it was. What? I, I totally forgot. You know how to fix a lawnmower? Repair a carburetor? Do an Excel spreadsheet? Do you know how to teach your children the Word of God? Well, that's the church's job. Uh-uh. Listen, dude, you're not putting that on us. If you're a man and you've got kids, you're to be the number one discipler in their life. Number one. And, dude, if you're not doing it, you're neglecting God's call on your life to be the prophet and speak truth into your home. Man, what do you let your kids watch on TV? Now, once you, oh, he's boy, I'm not talking about boycotting. I'm just talking about, have you ever sat down with your children and watched what they're watching? Because you know what cartoons on TV are like today? Let me explain to you cartoons on TV, majority of cartoons. The dad is always stupid. You seen the Berenstein Bears? That dad is an idiot. You know what I'm talking about? The dad is always a moron. He's stupid. He's an idiot. The mother, she's stupid half of the time. The other half of the time, she's too busy to work or figure anything out. The three-year-old is a genius, and the dog talks. And so the three-year-old and the dog have conversations, and, and sometimes the goldfish, like, pipes in. So the three-year-old, the dog, and the goldfish figure out the problem in the family. They bring the solution to mom and dad. And if it weren't for the three-year-old and the dog and the goldfish occasionally, the family would fall apart. And then you wonder why your kids grow up thinking you're stupid. Am I lying? You, listen, just all I'm challenging you to do is be aware. Because, men, you're responsible. See, see, men, a lot of people say, well, we need to get in church so my kid can learn the word of God. Now, we've got them for an hour a week. One hour a week. And let me tell you something right now about your children. They're learning about Jesus. We don't babysit in this church. We don't babysit. They're learning who Jesus is. We don't play that game. We, we teach your kids about Jesus. But we've got them for one hour a week. Dads, if, if you're a father here, there's 168 tennis balls in this cart. You've got them for 168 hours. Now, who's going to have more impact on their lives? If this is all the spiritual influence they're getting in their lives, men, and you're neglecting this, you've got a problem. It's up to you to know. I mean, kids learn how to cuss from their dad. Oh, don't tell me they don't. I did children's ministry for way too long. And I remember one day we're singing the song, Lean On Me. Y'all remember that? They grew up in youth group. Lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend. And this little kid messed it up. He messed up the song. And he stopped right in the middle of the thing. He said, you a-holes! And I went, what did what, what, you say? He said, they're all a-holes! It's like, would you take over? Take the kid out in the hall. I said, you can't say that. Then I asked, where did you learn that word? Kids will tell. Dad, you can't get mad at your four-year-old for letting them fly if you let them fly too. Oh, I'm older. Oh, sure. Sin has an age limit on it. I forgot. Dad, you can't get mad at your teenage son for being promiscuous if you're doing it too. Dad, you can't get mad at your kids going out and getting drunk and getting plastered when you modeled that behavior for them. I'm convinced, oh, it's tense in here. I'm convinced 
that if men would step up and be husbands and fathers like we're called to be, we could wipe out atheism in one generation. Because if our sons and our daughters could look at us men and say, what he has with God, that relationship that he has with God, I want that relationship with God. And instead of admiring people on television and instead of admiring rock stars and movie stars, men, if our children could admire us the way we're supposed to live our lives, we could wipe out atheism in the United States in one generation if we would just start loving Jesus and become men of the word like we're called to be men of the word. We're called to do it, man. I'm trying, man, man, this is easy. Because I, I know some of you go, I don't understand the Bible. Get a translation you can understand. Some of you grew up in a church that said, you can only read King James. And I'm going to be honest, if you could only read King James, I probably wouldn't read the Bible. I know that it flies on. King James is the only Bible you should read. You can really just get over that one. We don't, I read the NIV. I preach out of the NIV. You know what? Jesus speaks to me out of the New International Version. There's nothing wrong with that. The New Living Translation, those are the two I read the majority of the time. New International Version, New Living Translation. Pick up one of those translations, start reading. I would recommend the New Testament because you're going to start reading through the Old Testament. You're going to get Leviticus. The goat thing is going to freak you out, and you're not going to want to read anymore. So I would start with the New Testament. Some of you are going to go to Leviticus now and try to find the goat. So I'm sorry about that. See, men, here's why this is so important if we don't know the word. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to read this again. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Look at this, verse, verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, quote, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Let me stop right here. Men, God never said not to touch the fruit. God never said that. You go back through and read Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God never said do not touch it. Eve added that. Eve spoke untruth. And because Adam didn't correct it, eventually the family fell apart. Men, do you speak truth in your family? What if your kid comes to you and says, I don't believe Jesus is the way to God. I'm going to convert to this religion over here. Men, are you comfortable enough to say, you know what? Jesus is the way and these are the reasons why. And let's sit down and let's go through scripture and figure that out. Men, what if your eight-year-old when you tuck your eight-year-old in bed tonight, goes, Daddy, I want to become a Christian. Are you going to have to call somebody? Or could you lead your child to Jesus? Men, at the bare minimum, you and I should be able to lead our children to Jesus. And you do it by becoming a man of the word. Number three is the protector. And here's where the redneck comes out in all men. <laughs> I can do this. Protect my wife. And you, you can calm down, Bubba Redneck. That's not what we're talking about. Men are serious about this. I remember, I remember one time in Columbia, I was a groomsman. I was a groomsman in like 48 weddings before I got married. And uh, I was walking. You know, you, you know when, it's just when you're a groomsman or an usher or whatever you call it, there's all kind of titles. And I was like, you know, bride or groom. And uh, the woman said, groom, and I put my arm out, and she reaches out to, like, hold my arm, and I'm going to walk him out. And the man, like, kind of pushes me a little bit and grabs her arm. He looks at me and goes, that's my wife. And I'm like, okay, first of all, dude, she's not all that. You know, I didn't say that because this dude would have fought me. But I'm like, okay, we're in a, ch I was like, yeah, you, he's like, I'll walk her down. I was like, follow me. Yeah, I, I remember how protective he was over his wife. I would really call that obsessive, wouldn't you? The Bible doesn't say you need to be the obsessor. The Bible says that we need to be the protector. And a lot of men are like, I can do that. Ain't nobody going to touch my wife. I'll beat some boy. You look at my wife. That's really bad in the South. You know, have you ever walked through the mile, mall and smile? Hey, how you doing? How you doing? You, would you look at my girlfriend? You, know, you should calm down and get over that, okay? What I'm talking about is the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 5. This is what the protector is, and this is... This has become so real to me. Verse 27. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. In other words, men, the Bible talks about a radiant church, a radiant bride. With the way that we protect our family, they should radiate. They should illuminate. Let me give you several ways that we should protect our family. And this, you think this is intense, this is, this will be fun. The first way we should protect our family, men, letter A, is financially. Ooh, Lord, you knew we had to talk about money in the service. This is where some of y'all going, hold on to your wallet, baby. I told you this church was all about the money. Huh, it's not, no, no, not taking an offering right now, so calm down. What I'm talking about, men, is it's up to us to make sure that our family is financially okay. Now, I've got a biblical conviction about this that is so strong, and I can back it up with Scripture day after day after day. I believe, according to Scripture, the woman, if the, now, now, some, some, cause some of you are saying, oh, is this where again is the woman needs to be barefoot and pregnant and stay at home, and I told you I hate this guy. No, 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 listen. I, listen, women, you came a long way, baby. Some of y'all are, I mean, most of y'all, in fact, all of y'all are smarter than men, in my opinion. You have discernment. We don't, we don't have discernment. Not a lot of it. You're, you think through things, you're into details, we're not. I'm not saying you shouldn't work. I just think, according to Scripture, a woman should work because she wants to, not because she's forced to by her husband. And see, I, I can just hear the conversations when you leave. I hate him. Yeah, I can hear that. And, and, and those are the men, because the women are going, mm-hmm, all right, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Now, man, understand something. My wife is a doctor. And when we first got married, we made the decision that we were going to live off of my salary. I had just planted New Spring. We were broke. Like when, a, when an adult showed up at New Spring and we thought they might tithe, we followed them everywhere. Like, hey, hey, got a checkbook. Oh, checkbook. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Hey, we're going to take up an offering in this service. Think you might? Yeah, I, that's the way it was. And we could have moved out, and we could have got a nicer home, and we could have done all this stuff. But you know what? Financially, I was committed to us living on my salary, which was really tough. But you know what? It, Lucretia appreciated that because it didn't put unnecessary pressure on her to bring home the bacon. Men, it's up to you to protect your family financially when it comes to tithing. See, let me tell you something about your wife. She does not trust you spiritually if you make the case that you can afford the truck payment, but you can't afford to give God what it's his. There's a lack of trust there on her part for you to lead your family financially. It's just there. I'm telling you, it's there. Unless she's a gold digger. I ain't saying she is. We should write a song. That'd be great. <laughs> Note to self. No laughter in that one, you know? Financially. Men, it's up to us to protect our home. That means making wise financial decisions. And single guys, let me just tell you this. Now, the last time I said this, all the single guys, oh, not all the single guys, some of the single guys really got mad. So I'm saying it again. Single guys, you want to know, you, you know, you know what you need to do in order to get ready to get married? Get a job. If you're living with your mother or your grandma, I don't live with my grandma, that's worse. <laughs> a single woman in love with Jesus does not aspire to marry a dude delivering Papa John's pizzas part-time who has a blog and plays Halo. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, and all of this is going to be tough for some of you here. We had a guy get really mad last time I said this, and he fired off an email, wrote me a three-page letter, and confronted one of our staff members and said, now the last time you said, you know what you called every single woman in that church? I said, no. He said, you called every single woman in that church a whore. I said, really? So I did a survey among all the single women I knew. I said, excuse me, did you listen to the sermon Saturday, Sunday? She said, yeah. I said, at any point in that message, did you ever feel like a whore? <laughs> well, I know I didn't. Okay, just curious. Excuse me, excuse me, did, you, did at any point in the message, did you feel like a whore? No, no, no. I, no why do you ask? And I, did, I surveyed all the single women I knew. And you know what the single women told me? That's a guy that just don't want to work. How many single women in this room are looking for a guy that can just financially maybe take care of them? Would you raise your hand? 
I'm looking for a guy that can financially take care of me. Now, men, if you want to call all these girls that word after the service, we have a medic team that can hook you up because you're going to need it, bro. <laughs> Second is physically. Now, once again, the, 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 oh, he said whore. Okay, it's in the Bible, all right? That's, so get over that. <laughs> if this is your first Sunday at New Spring, you picked a good one, man. This is great. <laughs> Physically protect. Now, this is where some men go, I could physically protect my wife. That's not what I'm talking about. Men, listen to me. Listen to me. If you're going to physically protect your wife, you need to be there. You need to be there. So, you know, I travel. My job requires me to travel. Yeah, it, it might, but do you sign up for the travel opportunities to escape from your family? Well, I play softball or I play basketball. Hey, that's great. There's nothing wrong with playing softball or basketball. Here's my question. Do you do it because you love it or do you do it to escape from your family? The Bible says in Proverbs 27, verse 8, like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Man, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. This is a conviction that I've got. You know what I do every day when I leave work? I go home. I love my home. I love my wife. Every once in a while, we, we, we turn down, or I turn down about 80% of the speaking opportunities that I get. Now, Lucretia has modeled this for me. She's like, I want you here. I sat down, I had this conversation with my wife, man. Define success for me as a husband. Because when your wife defines success for you, listen, James Dobson can't define success for me as a husband. My wife defines success for me as a husband. A lot of you are like, I'm, you're just whipped. No, I'm a happily married man. It's my job to serve her. She defines, and she's like, I just like it when you're here. So we turned out about, you know, will you come pray at this thing in the community? No, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm praying with my wife. I love my wife. I'm home with my wife. Well, a pastor should be involved in the community. That's the problem with a lot of pastors. They're so involved with their community that their family goes to pits, and you've seen it. That ain't happening with me. I love being at home with my wife. Man, you got to be there. If you don't believe me, ask her. Let her see emotionally. Y'all remember when that Hurricane Katrina gas crisis hit? You remember that? We all went crazy. You remember that? I pulled into a gas station. This is true. I pulled into a gas station. There's a guy. He has five one-gallon jugs on the back of his truck. He's fill, get milk jugs. He's filling all of these milk jugs up, and he's smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I mean, this, this dude is dragging this. You know, I'm like, it's going to go through his nose. and It was incredible. And I pulled up next to him, and I looked at him, and he looked at me and waved. I I'm not feeling very comfortable at this point. In fact, you know what I did? I went to another gas station. Because I'm like, if he makes one mistake, all I, all I would ever hear is, oops. And that'd be it. Like, we'd all be gone. I drove off because I didn't want to be around when this guy made a mistake. And let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something. This is me camp. That's the way some of your wife feel about you when you come home I don't want to say the wrong thing I don't want to act the wrong way because they might blow up men it's up to us to protect our wives emotionally you know what men and, and listen Lucretia has taught me this she is teaching me this men when our wives open up to us emotionally it's our job to listen and try to understand we should never cut her off and say i can't believe you feel that way I, it, it's stupid that you would feel that way i don't understand that so i'm not talking about it your wife men wants to open up to you and be able to talk to you about anything and when you begin to shut her down and tell her that's stupid and that's dumb and you don't want to hear it it's going to cause some friction in your relationship she wants to be able to trust you be vulnerable with you and tell you anything and she wants to feel like you care about her you're sitting and listening like talking between the com you know talking during the commercials that's not emotional connection sitting at the dinner table and grunting every once in a while is not emotional connection she needs to feel like she's taken care of you sitting in the car with the kids her in the house you honking the horn hurrying her up that's not emotional connection in fact she's a godly woman she'll sit down make you wait a little longer and men you know what she wants you to be emotionally connected with her she wants you to open up and be honest with her now this is where some men go I'm just not an emotional man you are a liar 
You're a liar. I'm just not emotional. I've seen, you know, she don't believe you either because she's seen you watch too many football games. <laughs> Nobody who's a Clemson fan went to the Clemson game yesterday and said, well, the offense seems to have been stalling today. Wow, is that an interception? Golly gee. None of you who are South Carolina fans said, well, they blocked the kick again. Looks like we lost. Chucks, honey. I mean, nobody did that. Amen? Let me tell you, she just wants you to be as emotional about her as you are about football sometimes. Let her be a spiritual lie. Man, let me be honest with you. This is my deal. It doesn't have to be your deal. I don't have a verse to support this. But every night before I go to bed, this is something Lucretia and I have done since the first night we were married. Every night before I go to bed, I pray with my wife. And you know why I do that? Man, it's hard to pray with a woman when you're mad at her. Like, how do you do that? Go and get her in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, you can't. Like, she don't like that prayer, you know what I'm saying? It's hard to pray with a woman when you're mad at her. So I can honestly say this, in, in, in um, over six years of marriage, I've never gone to bed mad at my wife. Now, I've gone to bed knowing there's some things we got to work out the next day. But, but when you pray with a woman, you can't be mad at her. You just can't. It's our job, men, to spiritually protect our home. To spiritually pray over our children. To spiritually pray, to pray over our wife. Here's what bothers me. In every society all across the world, there is a transition where a boy becomes a man. Whether it's jumping out of a tree with a vine tied around your leg or going and facing a lion or jumping in a cave or whatever. There's something that a boy does to become a man. And unfortunately, in America, a boy becomes a man when he can look at his mother and say, I'm not going to church with you today. I'm staying home with my father. And that's men who have walked away and refused to guard their family spiritually. Single guys, you need, to, you need to be ready to guard a woman spiritually. Let me tell you something. Some of you singles are some of you people that are dating. Girls, if you're dating a guy and he's asking you to do things that you know are unbiblical and are, are ungodly and are wrong, don't marry that guy because he don't have your best interest in mind. He's not trying to protect you spiritually. He's not becoming more like Jesus. He's becoming more like Satan because he's trying to manipulate you for his own good. Spiritually, it's our job, men, to protect our families. Let me read this again in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. I told you we're coming back to it. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was, was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Adam's just standing there. Right, men? A lot of people are like, why does a man get all... He's just standing there. He watched the whole thing. He's standing there. Now, let me ask this question. Who sinned first? It was Eve. Eve messed it up. I heard if it wouldn't have been for Eve, no, 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 if it wouldn't have been for Adam. Because God came looking for somebody. And in Scripture, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord. See, men love to run from problems, and men love to run from God. Look at this. Hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man. Where are you? God didn't come looking for Eve. God came looking for the man. God didn't come for Eve. He didn't even come for the serpent. God called to the man and said, Where are you? I think as God looks... All across America and the world today, he's still looking out, calling to the men, where are you? Man, I wish I had this down. I wish I was perfect. I don't speak to you out of my successes this morning. I speak to you out of my failures. But you know what's so beautiful about being a man is God gave us a second chance. 
And maybe you're here this morning, you have not embraced the role of biblical manhood. There's a second chance for you. I was reminded of this this past Thursday night, watching the Rutgers versus Louisville game. Isn't that a great game? It's a great game. Rutgers, the underdog team, like nobody feared Rutgers. Like everybody scheduled Rutgers for their homecoming. You know what I'm saying? Rutgers. And all of a sudden, Rutgers are undefeated, and they're playing the Louisville Cardinals, and the Louisville Cardinals are like number three in the nation, and they're kicking everybody's rear end, man. The Louisville Cardinals are rocking, and they're playing the Rutgers. And all of a sudden, the Rutgers start coming back, and it was a great football game, and they tied it up 25-25 and or whatever. And the next thing you know, that, that they had like 20 seconds left on the clock. They got in field goal range, and Jeremy Ito, the field goal kickers for the Rutgers, comes out, and all he's got to do is kick a 33-yard field goal. 33 yards, and I know some. I could kick a 33-yard field goal. No, you can't. You couldn't do it. All right, so anyway, 33 yards. And the snap, the spot, the hole, Jeremy Ito kicks the ball. He had kicked 33-yard field goals all his life. Middle school, high school, college. This guy could do it with his eyes closed. And I remember watching it. He hooked it. He missed the field goal. Can you imagine how he felt, man? Can you imagine the pressure? Everybody came up probably to him and said, it's all right, but they didn't mean it. But there was a flag on the play. You remember this? There was a flag on the play. Somebody from Louisville had jumped off sides. And he got a second chance. A little bit closer, 28-yard field goal, nailed it. Rutgers win the game and, over, and, and overcome impossible odds. You say, what does that have to do with me and God and Jesus and all that stuff? Let me tell you something, men. Biblically, let's just be honest. As men, some of us in this room... We have, we have ran the ball down the field. We've executed perfectly, and we are men of God. But there are some people that you move down the field, but every time you have a chance to become the man that God wants you to be, you miss it. You hook it left. You miss the opportunity that God has for you and for me to step up and become a man. But you know what, guys? Here's the beautiful thing. 2,000 years ago, Jesus jumped off sides. Jesus jumped off sides. There was a penalty called on Jesus. The penalty that was supposed to be for us, it was actually placed on him, and he died for our sins. And because of him, we can live a life in eternity with him, but also we can step up and because, become the man that he's called us to be. Because Jesus jumped off sides, men, you and I get a second chance to become what he originally called us to become, a man who's a priest and a prophet and a protector. Let's pray. God, this has not been an easy message for us to hear because, because God, there's just there's tons of tension in this room. Lord, I just pray that you would have your way in us this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God called to the man. He said, where are you? Where are you? I'm going to do something this morning. We sort of did this last week, and we're going to do it again today. I believe there's some men here that need to come talk to God about stepping up and becoming the man in their home. About becoming the father for their children. I believe there might be a man here this morning that needs to take his wife's hand and walk forward and pray with her and just say, today, honey, today, today, I'm going to fight for your heart and I'm going to be the man in this relationship. There might, even need, there might even be a man that needs to swallow his pride this morning and look at his wife and ask, would you pray for me that I could become the man that God wants me to be? Last week in this service, I said something like this, and not that many people came forward because you were too worried. You were, there was pride in your heart, and you're like, if I walk forward, people might think that I'm not this or I'm not that, but this is not about what people think. This is about you and God. 
Men, if God has called you to come forward and pray and get things right with him, if God has called you, some of you ladies may just need to pray for your husband right where you sit, but if God has called you forward, you don't miss this opportunity as we just listen to the band play, you obey God and do what he has called you to do. If he's called you to come forward and pray, you just do that. in the balcony you want to come just we'll wait this is this is for you this is as much as it's for anybody I'm not going to draw this out, guys, but the people are coming, people praying. God's giving you a second chance this morning. Maybe you don't come forward. Maybe right where you are, you, you bow your head and you close your eyes and you say, God, right now, I embrace this second chance to become a man. Ladies, maybe you're here this morning. Your husband is not. Lift him up right now. And say, Jesus, grab his heart. Help him to become a man. Jesus Christ, you are the ultimate man, the warrior, the king who fought for the hearts of those that you would draw to yourself. And Jesus, you died so we could live. You are the ultimate man. You came in supreme power, but you humbled yourself to serve your church and to care for your church and nurture your church and you've never walked away and you've never given up and you've never turned your back Jesus you have always been there for us so as men dear God I pray that we could have the devotion to our wives and to our families that you have to the church to be there to serve to lead to never walk away. Jesus, I pray for the single guys this morning in this church. Jesus, that you would become the man in their eyes. So Jesus, they could love a woman like you love the church. 
May we embrace what you call a man in Scripture. As hard as it is, may we embrace it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being here. Let me just say this. If you're a man this morning, you want to talk to somebody about receiving Jesus. I challenge you after the service, there will be people all along the front of the stage that want to talk to you. Or you can indicate on your tarot card, have somebody contact me, and someone will contact you. Men, it was tough. Today it was tough. You think you've been wrestling with it for the past 45 minutes? I wrestled with it for a month. That's how long I've been working on that message. Now, ladies, next week, it's your Sunday. And the men have all said, you're going to be here next week. I can tell. I saw that conversation happening. So next Sunday, ladies, the sermon is going to be very challenging for you. Ushers, you come forward, and we're going to sing one more song. Let's raise the roof off this place in this one.